All right, welcome to class. We're going to continue discussing the age of the universe, the age of the earth. We said uh, last week this is an extremely important topic because if the universe is not billions of years old, the argument for evolution is over. You win in the first round. And we've been going through some of the different scientific ways to show the earth cannot be billions of years old. Well, now we've covered things in space. Now we're going to look at things in on the earth, okay? We've covered just a couple in the last, last week. We're going to go through a few more. The Mississippi River, this textbook says, is depositing sediments at the rate of 80,000 tons every hour. It is known as the Muddy Mississippi. If you've ever gone to visit the Mississippi, any place in New Orleans or even south of St. Louis, it's just real murky water because there's so much erosion, a large drainage basin drains into the Mississippi, and lots of topsoil goes with it. The Mississippi is moving very slowly. It only drops eight inches a mile on the average, and it's 920-mile run from up north clear down to the New Orleans Delta. But as it dr brings this mud down there, eventually when it slows down, the mud drops out. It uh, Sediment drops out of the river, and it makes this delta. A delta is made of mud that a river carried in and then dropped off. As long as the faster water moves, the more sediments it can hold and the bigger chunks of sediment it can hold. As soon as it slows down, they drop off. Maybe you've seen up north where they put snow fences. How many have ever seen those before? The purpose of a snow fence is the blowing snow, as soon as it hits that fence, it slows down just enough that it drops the snow out of the wind. Because at a certain speed, it just the flakes fall out. And you put the snow fence a certain distance away from the road, so it drops the snow instead of on the highway, it drops it away from the highway. Well, moving water does the same thing. As soon as it slows down, it drops the sediments. That's why you see sandbars at places where the river turns and bends. It drops the sediments out and it makes sandbars right there in the bends of the river. Mississippi River is dropping all this sediment in New Orleans and it's making this delta grow larger and larger. The sediment or the mud probably really starts up near Memphis, Tennessee. All the rest of it is filled in with sediments, clear down to Louisiana. Because it's all sediments, the whole state of Louisiana, or most of the state of Louisiana, is slowly sinking. Very difficult to build a highway and keep it strong across Louisiana. Drive over Highway 20 sometime and you'll see what I'm talking about. So every few years they've got to repair it because it's just it's on spongy ground. There just isn't a good way to build a solid highway. But this delta is growing larger. Estimates range from 10,000 to 30,000, so I picked a high number to be... Uh, merciful to the evolutionist to give them all the benefit of the doubt I can. The delta is certainly less than 30,000 years old. The Mississippi changes course all the time. It used to, till the town of New Orleans became so dependent on the Mississippi. It's trying to change course again. Mississippi is trying very hard to bypass the town of New Orleans, and so the Army Corps of Engineers and all sorts of smart people have been out there trying to figure out how to keep the river in this channel because it doesn't want to stay there. Maybe you've seen projects uh, and stuff on the news about that, but they're try fighting desperately, spending millions of dollars to keep it where it is. Because if that section of the Mississippi dried up, well, the whole town of New Orleans loses a lot of, uh, a lot of industry, because now their boats can't go, and it all goes back to money. But the delta is about 30,000 years or less. So the obvious question would be, if the Earth is billions of years old, why isn't the whole Gulf of Mexico full of mud? Now, the evolutionist will say, well, it's 30,000 years. That proves the Bible is wrong because the Bible says 6,000 years. Now, <clears throat> if you look through um, typical secular textbooks, they will say there was an ice age 10,000 years ago and there was an ice age 30,000 years ago and there was an ice age 100,000 years ago. Where are they getting these numbers from? They're getting the 30,000 number from this delta. This is their explanation for why there's only 30,000 years worth of mud. They'll say, well, that was the end of the last ice age. That's their answer. Well, it could be there's only 30,000 years worth of mud out there because it's not millions of years old. They say the 10,000 years for the last ice age because of the Niagara Falls problem. That's their answer. Their answer is always, well, an ice age is reset the clock and started it again. Well, maybe so, but maybe, uh, maybe the Earth is not millions of years old. The fact is, it's not full of mud. This is a picture of the oldest tree in the world. It's called the Bristlecone Pine Trees in Southern California. They're in the White Mountains, way up in the mountains. Very inhospitable climate. Very little rain. The Bristlecone Pine, the largest one, they call it the oldest one, I'm sorry. They call it the Methuselah Tree is the nickname for it, for obvious reasons. The Methuselah Tree is uh, 
4,300 years old. Now, you need to understand, tree ring dating is not an exact science. Trees, the rings on a tree do not indicate summer, winter, summer, winter. They can indicate lots of rain, no rain, lots of rain, no rain. I met a guy a few weeks ago at a church I was at. He said, Brother Hovind, I have been raising trees to make walking sticks, professional, expensive walking sticks for rich people. <laughs> I didn't know there's a market for that, but that's what he does. He carves these fancy walking sticks for people. He says, I have raised thousands of trees and made these walking sticks. He said, I raised my trees for seven years, cut them down, and they always have an average of 11 rings in seven years. Well, how do you get 11 rings in seven years if they're annual rings? See, they aren't annual rings. So tree ring dating is a far cry from an exact science, especially with these trees because they're such a gnarled mess. I mean, they kind of grow this way a while, and then they grow this way a while, and it's just not a simple science for counting these. And you don't want to cut it down to count the rings because then you found the age, but you killed the tree. So they've got a special drill. It's like a little pipe. It's hollow, and it drills a, a pipe into the tree, a core and pulls out the middle part, just like they do with the ice rings, only these are much smaller. The entire pipe is about the size of the lead in a pencil. And they drill all the way into the tree and pull out this real skinny core, lay it down, and they have to count the rings under a microscope. Because these trees grow about an inch in a hundred years. So in an inch, you've got a hundred rings to count. When you look at the trees, they're ugly, you will swear they're dead, but they're not, they're still alive. And they don't mark which one is the oldest because they're afraid souvenir hunters are going to go up there and say, I want to have a piece of this one. And there's only so many, only so many pieces of it you can get, and pretty soon it's, it's not there anymore. But if you go up to the White Mountains in Southern California and see the bristlecone pine trees, the oldest one is 4,300 years old. Some will say, no, there's, they found one that's 4,600. Some will say, well, by overlapping tree ring dating with tree stumps and logs found in Indian uh, dwellings and stuff like this, the ancient cliff dwellings, they overlap these tree ring and they get a tree ring sequence that goes back 8,000 years. Well, this is real questionable because tree ring dating, first, is not an exact science. Secondly, two trees can grow side by side and have very different ring pattern. If there's a big tree and a little tree, the big one gets all the sunlight, the little one doesn't get any. One day the big one dies, now the little one gets all the sunlight, so his growth pattern is much different. You can have two trees on opposite sides of the same mountain getting different amounts of rainfall because when, hot air, when air goes up, it drops all of its water. When it comes down the mountain, it, it absorbs water. That's called the rain shadow in Washington State. One side of the mountains is loaded with trees. As soon as you get over the top, it's, it's basically desert because as air rises, it cools and drops its moisture. When it comes down, it warms up and absorbs moisture. So you get what's called a rain shadow on one side of the mountain. And so trees can be affected by this. So what they've tried to do to discredit the creationists on this tree ring dating question is try to find tree ring sequences where they find a tree that has several rings. You know, they look at the ring pattern where they're kind of close and then they're far apart and they're kind of close for several years and then far apart for a few years. They, they would consider these to be the good years when it got lots of rain. These would be the bad years when it didn't get much rain. Then they find another log someplace else and they try to line it up. You know, so they got good years, bad years, good years, bad years, and this one will extend farther and this one will extend farther this way. And so they've stretched their tree overlapping tree ring dating to, I don't know what the number is, probably close to 6,000 years. But this would be based on all sorts of very obvious assumptions and it wouldn't hold up two seconds in a court of law. The problem is it doesn't have to hold up in a court of law. It just has to be taught in school. You just have to convince the kids of it. That's where the problem comes in right there. So the oldest living tree is 4,300 years old. Now, the creationist solution to this is very simple. There was a flood 4,400 years ago that destroyed the world. And it would have wiped out everything. However, many trees can be uprooted, float around in a flood, and land, and start growing again. I mean, don't they transplant bushes and trees all the time? So in a flood situation, the flood, Noah was in the ark for over a year. That does not mean every square inch of the world was flooded for an entire year. It just means, all we know is Noah was in the ark for a year. Certain sections of ground might have only been underwater for a month. The crust of the earth would be lifting and sinking and there would be shuffling and water sliding back and forth, carrying sediments with it, lots of uh, mud layers being laid down during this flood. 
So when I say the flood lasted a year, it's really technically more correct to say Noah was in the ark for a year. He hit bottom in the seventh month. Now, if you have floating log mats of stuff floating around that's been uprooted and drifting around, the seeds, of course, are going to be able to survive soaked in this water for a short time and then re-germinate. Go any place where there's been a flood. After the flood water goes down, the mud out there, things start to sprout very quickly. Actually, many countries depend upon the annual floods to give them a new layer of sediment, new layer of topsoil. And they come in and build dikes and levees, and now the soil gets depleted after a time. It's one of the problems in, in, along the central part of the United States. But the tree ring dating, I just wanted to point out, is certainly not an exact science. But the oldest one they've counted clearly and pretty certainly is 4,300 rings. Assumption is 4,300 years. It's, it's, it's that at a maximum, probably less than that as far as its age. So the creationist has no problem with the oldest tree. says, hey, the flood was 4,400 years ago. Not a problem. This is a picture of a coral reef going underwater. The largest reef in the world is in Australia. It's called the Great Barrier Reef. That'll be a quiz question. Where's the largest reef in the world and what's the name of it? Uh, Great Barrier Reef is, I believe, 1,500 miles long. I'm not, I should have looked that number up, but it's something like that. 1,500 miles of coral. It's absolutely gigantic. We went out and saw it. Eric was there and Marlissa and my wife and Ken Andrew. Uh, we saw the Great Barrier Reef, and it's uh, extremely impressive to watch it. Just beautiful, the stuff down there. We took a, one of those glass-bottom boats out, and you can see all the fish down there. Well, during World War II, some of the reef was damaged because there, there are very few places you can get through the reef to get ships in and out. You don't want to go drive 1,500 miles to go around the reef, so they just blasted holes through it. Now, based on the damage done to the reef, when they watched it regrow over the next 20 years, they did a study on this, they said the Great Barrier Reef is less than, than uh, 4,200 years old. There's a great article in Creation Magazine dealing with this. One of their figures they came up with was 3,700 years. This is the new Creation Magazine, but if you want some fascinating reading, it's like $22 a year to get Creation Magazine. It's for, through Ken Ham's ministry up in uh, Florence, Kentucky south of Cincinnati. Um, the article in Creation Magazine is in volume 8, number 1, on page 6. This it was an older issue. It'd be almost worth, if you had the money, to get all the back issues. They've been doing this for 10 years, so it cost you 200 bucks or something like that. But they're really excellent articles in here, if you want to look through one of those. Uh, probably, if I could only afford a couple of things to subscribe to, I would subscribe to Creation Magazine. I can give you the number if you want to write it down. It's 800-350-3232. 800-350-3232, or their website is answersingenesis.org, O-R-G. And I don't agree with everything they put in here, but most of the time it's just really fascinating stuff and well-documented. So a great article about the Great Barrier Reef, if you want to read more on that, would be found in this back issue of Creation Magazine. And they said one of the studies showed 3,700 years. Now, some of the scoffers have tried to say, no, no, reefs can grow, uh, they grow slower than that. And they look at, I think it's the uh, one of the reefs in the Pacific Ocean, around one of the islands, I believe it's Bikini Atoll, if I'm not mistaken, where they say they drill down in the reef and pull up a core sample of reef and find out the coral has layers to it, sort of like tree rings, as colonies grow on top of old colonies. And they say it's much older than the creationists allow for. This would be what the skeptics will tell you. Okay, several factors affect coral growth. If a coral reef is farther from the surface of the water, it grows faster as it approaches near the surface, because the tide's going up and down, the coral is exposed for part of the day, now the growth rate slows way down. So the rate of growth depends very much on how much nutrition it's getting. If it's near an area where there's a river coming out right at that area, like one of these Australian rivers exits right there, brings all sorts of nutrients out, lots of stuff for the coral to eat, it's going to grow faster. If it's not near a river, it's going to grow slower. If the water is clear, the sunlight penetrates, and it gets sunlight, so it's going to grow faster. If the water's murky, it's not going to get uh, the same growth rate. So it's not just a simple science of saying, let's just measure it, and it's not quite that simple. But the estimates are certainly less than 4,200 years. Some may be, maybe even less than 3,700 years. So the creationist has no problem with this. He says, yeah, there was a flood that destroyed the world 4,400 years ago. This is Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, this textbook tells the kids, has been eroding for 9,900 years. Now, how would they know that? Well, if you've ever seen Niagara Falls, you know it's a lot of water going over the edge there. 
And as the water goes over the edge, it breaks off the rocks on the edge, so the falls is eroding its way backwards. All waterfalls do this, depending on how hard the material is and how much water goes over it and how abrasive it is. If there's lots of stuff in the water, like sand and ice and tree stumps, it's more abrasive. It's tend, tend to erode faster. But the Niagara Falls is breaking rocks off the edge. The indication, since it was first discovered and at least recorded by uh, scientists up there back in the uh, 1700s, they, know, they marked where it was. It's been progressively moving backwards. The Niagara Falls Museum guide says it's been going 4.7 feet a year. That's what's been observed for several hundred years. Now, that doesn't mean the erosion rate's always been the same, but if you get a several hundred year average, that's something to consider. Okay? Now, Niagara Falls flows down into what's called the Niagara Gorge, a canyon at the bottom of the falls. It's absolutely, you've been there, haven't you, Eric? Saw Niagara Falls? We went over it in a helicopter, didn't we? That was amazing. Uh, anybody else been there to Niagara Falls? Just, you can't imagine it. In 1930, I believe it was 1930, somewhere in there, they built a, a, a canal to drain the water off of the river to a hydroelectric plant. So the water has to flow through their turbines as it falls to produce electricity. Which means much or even sometimes all of the water can be channeled away and they dry up the waterfall, which stops erosion. But up until 1930, it was eroding 4.7 feet a year. Since then, it's re eroded slower because they're diverting much water for hydroelectric power. They usually turn on the falls <laughs> during tourist season, and for the rest of the year, they turn them, basically shut them, almost shut them down. They can divert the water to this hydroelectric plant. So they leave some going over for the tourist effect, you know. But they, they could sometimes in, in real uh, drought seasons, they'll have to use it all. Niagara, if you look at the uh, Great Lakes, the five Great Lakes, they drain into each other. One fills up and spills over into the next one and spills over into the next one. This is the point where the Lake Erie spills over into, um, what's the lake above it, Ontario? Yes, Lake Ontario. So as it spills over, it runs through this little channel called the Niagara River, which is not very long. The, right si or the left side is Canada. The right side is New York. This town of Buffalo, New York, is right there, and then Ontario, Canada on the other side. But Niagara Falls has moved back about seven and a half miles from where it started. You can tell where it started by the edge of the old cliff. It's moved back seven and a half miles. Now, the textbook here says it's been eroding for 9,900 years. Well, they get that number from taking, you know, seven and a half miles divided by how fast it's moving back. Actually, they didn't do their math very well either uh, for this public school textbook. It should have been 8,400 years, not 9,900 years. If you take seven and a half miles times 5,280 feet in a mile divided by... Uh, 4.7, you get 8,400 years, but what do you expect? It's a public school textbook. You know, <laughs> it's not accurate in lots of other places, too. But the, the reason Niagara Falls is where it is is because of the, um, the flood 4,400 years ago. Right after the flood was over, you would have two factors that you don't have today. You would have more water flowing over and softer dirt. Right after the flood, you get an earth covered with layers of sediment. It's going to take a while for that to get hard. Maybe first 10 years, it would get a certain percentage of its hardness and then gradually get harder as time goes along. And today, it's solid rock. But for the first, you know, first 10 or 15 years, it was probably much, much softer. Especially the first few weeks, as the water's running off from this flood, it probably eroded half of the, half of the gully or the valley in a few minutes. Remember that gravel pit we went... Uh, Motorcycle riding in all the time after that one big rainstorm made a giant canyon about a third as big as this room <laughs> just after one rainstorm. It's unbelievable what water can do when it really gets moving. The other problem you have is when water really gets going, it picks up lots of debris and it becomes like liquid sandpaper. So now it erodes even faster because of the uh, uh, abrasiveness of the material. Okay, Niagara Falls. Let's uh, take a quiz here. Not a quiz, but ask a few questions. Who was uh, responsible, one of the main guys responsible for turning our education system humanist? He signed the Humanist Manifesto. John Dewey. John Dewey. There we go. Good, good, good. What uh, year was the Humanist Manifesto signed, the first one? 1933. Do you like raisins? <laughs> 1933. Uh, what year did Darwin's book come out? 1859. There we go. Okay. 
You got that one? Let's see. Let me think of another question. Okay, I got it. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Niagara River runs into what lake? Ontario. Lake Ontario. Somebody got it over there, too. Who is that? Did you get that, brother? No. You did? We didn't get it. We'll take you, it. You'll take the raisin. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> How long is the uh, valley at the bottom of Niagara Gorge? Seven and a half miles. There we go. And what's the erosion rate right now? 4.7 feet a year. Okay. Good. Have some more in a minute. Look at a couple more facts here and we'll take a little break. The oceans are getting saltier every day. I had quite an interesting debate uh, last night with the two very skeptical students that came to the meeting when I spoke in Alabama. And they argued about this point for quite a while. They said the oceans are not getting saltier. Well, there's many lengthy studies have been done about the salinity of the oceans. Waters from the river flow into the oceans, obviously. All of them end up there eventually. About 30% of the rainwater goes into the oceans. The rest is evaporated back right off the land or soaks into the water table, the, the aquifer is called. As the water evaporates out of the ocean, it leaves behind all of its salt. What's this process called? Hmm? Well, as the oceans get saltier, it's called salination, but the removing of fresh water is called evaporation or desalination. There's a couple other names for it. It desalinates the water. There are uh, emergency uh, crews or kits that they put on uh, aircraft if they crash in the ocean. They have a little... Uh, ball you blow up full of air, the sunlight will uh, distill. Distillation, it's called. It'll distill the salt water and make it you know, separate the salt from the fresh water. And it makes about a quart a day, so you've got to be careful. You know, Don't take a bath every morning. No. <laughs> there was a guy who wanted to see if he could row across the ocean in a rowboat. Right away, you got to wonder about the guy. Okay. But... Uh, he decided he could train his body to drink salt water. So he started a couple of months early before the trip drinking just a little bit of salt water along with the rest of his water throughout the day. He would just add a little bit of salt water. Over a period of several months, I think it was six months, he got used to salt water. He could drink it. What happens typically when people get out in the ocean and they're, they're dying of thirst they will wait until they're just about to die, and then they stick their head overboard and start drinking salt water, which makes them get sick and vomit, so they lose more fluids, and they end up dying of dehydration in the middle of water. You know, the Navy had an expression, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. Um, so, right. So they, uh, this guy decided he thought could train his body to drink salt water, and he did, and he, I believe, rode across the ocean or made it quite a ways out without... Uh, just drinking, living off the salt water. You could. It'd be kind of hard on your kidneys, I would think, because they have to filter out the water, but I guess you could get your body used to this. If anything you do gradually, you probably can get used to. People get used to drinking whiskey, I suppose. So I guess you can get used to about anything else. But the oceans are getting saltier every day. Now, there's many different salts that go into the ocean. There are aluminum salts and all sorts of different salts. There's a great article about uh, the various different salts washing into the oceans. It's one of the um, impact articles. I-M-P-A-C-T. I have all of the back issues. They're put out by Institute for Creation Research, ICR. They would be well worth getting. Just little one-page articles. They're 10 cents apiece. They started in 1974, I believe, and they do one a month, so they're up to number 350 right now. So for 35 bucks, you can get all of the back issues if you really want some fascinating reading. They have several of them just on this issue of how much salt goes into the ocean every, every year, and how much is the ocean gaining, uh, how old can the ocean be based on the amount of salt it gains? And it depends which one of the salts you want to measure. And I don't know, there's probably 50 different salts that they measure in this study. But uh, bottom line is, all of them uh, give different ages, but mo many of them center around a 5,000-year figure. The ocean could have gotten where it is today in less than 5,000 years as far as the amount of salt in the ocean. Today, it's 3.6% salt, and it could have gotten there in 5,000 years or less. Some of them give less than that. Some numbers, some of the numbers are like 100,000 years for the salts. So these skeptics were saying, well, the ocean is getting rid of its salt. I said, really, how is it doing that? Well, one way they say is the, when, it, when the wind blows, 
the water sprays up on the beach and dries up and leaves the salt behind. Oh, well, how, far, how big of an area does that affect? We're, what, six miles from the beach? Do we get any salt spray here? No. you got to be within a very short distance of the beach. As soon as it rains, it washes back in, you know. This is not a good way to get rid of the salt. They're trying to say there are some uh, other methods of the salt getting, being eliminated from the ocean water, and there may be some, some minor factors here. All this is taken into consideration. If you want to get into the study of this, I would recommend the impact article. I don't know the number. I could look it up. Impact article is one of the early ones uh, in, the first, in the hundreds uh, about the salinity of the oceans. Well, one of the skeptics asked me in a debate I was in one time, he said, now, Mr. Hoven, uh, could you please tell the audience how the freshwater fish survived in Noah's flood? Interesting question, because today freshwater fish and saltwater fish, you know, can't survive in the opposite environment very long. I said, well, sir, you're, and Eric, you'll find this as you speak. Most of the skeptics, their question is based on a faulty assumption. And all you got to do is look at the question they're asking you and find out where your problem is. Like the guy said, we've got 135,000 layers of ice that are annual rings. How did this happen in 4,400 years? Well, this question contains a faulty assumption. They're not annual rings. So this guy said, how did the freshwater fish survive in the flood? I said, well, sir, you're assuming the flood was salt water. I mean, isn't that an obvious assumption in his question? He said, well, the ocean is salt water. I said, well, yes, sir, it is today. That doesn't mean it was during the flood. I think during the flood, it was probably all fresh water, or mostly fresh water, and all the animals were fresh water. And in the last 40, 400 years, many animals have become salt water adapted. They have adapted to salt water. And he said, well, see, that's evolution. I said, no, sir. Today we have freshwater alligators and saltwater alligators. And they probably had a common ancestor, an alligator. He said, well, see, that's evolution. I said, man, come on, think about it. Going from freshwater alligator to a saltwater alligator is a very minor change compared to what you think happened. You think they changed from a rock to an alligator, <laughs> which, of course, would be a very big change. Um, there was a fellow in Minnesota, and I wish I'd written down the details, but anybody could try this experiment, I suppose. He came to me after a seminar one time, and he said, Mr. Hovind, I raise fish. I love fish. I have an aquarium. I have two aquariums, actually, huge aquariums in my house. He said, I have a saltwater aquarium and a freshwater aquarium. He said, now, I know that ocean water is about 3.6% salt. He said, I got curious many years ago. I wondered if I could mix all my fish together. He said, so I figured out the mathematics behind slowly increasing the salt in my freshwater aquarium. Because every few weeks, you got to change the water, you know, change half of the water every two weeks or something like that. So he did all the math on how to change, add salt to his freshwater and subtract salt from his saltwater aquarium. He did it very slowly so that it took him 10 years to make the change. After 10 years, both aquariums were 1.8% salt. All of the fish doing fine, and so he mixed them all together. Now, if somebody can do that in 10 years, going from 0 to 1.8% salt, do you think in 4,400 years the fish or animals could adapt to a salt change from 0 to 3.6%? Well, that's no problem. The evolutionists are great at straining out gnats and then swallowing camels. They will pick on one little detail they don't agree with on the creation account. Like, how did Noah fit all those animals on the boat? I said, well, I don't know. So, see, you couldn't be done. <laughs> Just because I don't know doesn't mean it couldn't be done. Okay. Secondly, the fact that this is an unanswered question so far doesn't prove we all came from a rock. Strain out the gnat and swallow a camel. They're just really good at it. So, the salt water to fresh water change probably took place after the flood. And even today, there are huge salt domes underground that are leaking into the oceans. The ocean is gaining salt from all sorts of places. In Grand Saline, Texas, halfway from Longview to Dallas, the town called Grand Saline. Saline means salt. Uh, years ago, it was discovered right on the surface of the ground, there was pure salt. Animals would stop there and lick it all the time. So they began to dig it out and sell it. And they kept digging down and digging down and found out it's what's called a salt plume. It is absolutely enormous. There are hundreds and hundreds of people that work at this salt mine, if I understand it. 
Here's the surface of the ground. They had seen a little patch of salt right here. It turned out to be a massive salt plume. Apparently, from way down deep inside the earth, this was hot and bubbling, and it came up and solidified just before it popped out through the surface. It's pure salt. They dig into it with bulldozers and backhoes and everything else. I mean, it's gigantic. It's many miles across of solid, pure salt. Uh, it would be a good thing for you to do, Eric, is to look up salt in the encyclopedia and just read it. And you can see some of the pictures of this. And when they dig it out, of course, you can't just dig it all out because your roof uh, falls in. So they will dig tunnels down and dig shafts off to the side. And even when they're digging off to the side, they can't dig a big area out because the roof falls in. If you looked at it from the top, they dig what's called a checkerboard pattern. They leave little squares of pillars to hold the roof up. And they dig out everything in between. And they've calculated, you know, how hard is the salt, how much weight can it hold, and how big does our pillar have to be, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They want to dig out the maximum without having it collapse on them. So they can only actually mine a certain percentage of it, maybe 40%, and the rest is wasted just as structural support. It's that way with any underground mine. They have to leave some material behind. So the salt in the ocean is not a problem for the creationist. Probably the oceans were largely fresh water at the time of the flood. There may have been some mixing of water. Uh, may have been some saltwater animals before the flood, maybe saltwater lakes like we have today. I don't know. But uh, this is nothing, no problem we have to worry about. All right, let's take a little break. and we come back, we'll discuss some more ways to show the Earth is not millions of years old. All right, let's continue now with some uh, ways to show the Earth is not millions of years old. By the way, for the quiz next week, we will have, or when, whenever the next quiz is, we'll have one of the questions will be, what is the erosion rate of the Niagara River? And the rate is of the Niagara Falls. The rate is 4.7 feet a year is the current rate right now. Uh, what is the evolutionist's answer to why the Niagara River or Gorge is only 7.5 miles long? What's their answer to that? Ice age. Ice age, right. Not proven, but interesting theory. Okay. When water drips through the ground... Yes, sir. There, is, there, were any ice age there certainly were I, at least one major ice age, a couple of theories about when it was... Um, the, when ice melts back, when a glacier melts back, it leaves behind obvious signs, like piles of rock that it piles up called a drumlin or a kettle lake or terminal moraines. There's obvious glacial effects that are found all over Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois. No question, ice came clear down to Kansas City, Missouri. The question is, when did this happen? And we get into that quite a bit in video number six of my series on the Hovind theory about when was the ice age and all this kind of stuff. Okay, when water goes through the ground, it soaks through the ground, if it is on decaying plant material, when plants decay, it produces what's called carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is one of many, many different acids. It dissolves limestone. If you take uh, uh, boric acid or battery acid or muriatic acid, which is hydrochloric, the same stuff in your stomach, hydrochloric acid that adjusts your food, you can buy muriatic acid at the hardware store for $2 a gallon, and you pour it on concrete driveways. You'll see it foam and bubble, and, <laughs> and if you leave it there long enough, it'll eat a hole through your driveway. It'll dissolve your concrete. <laughs> eats, it, eats, it, eats it right off. Well, slightly acidic water, the stronger the acid is, the faster it eats the rock, okay? Particularly limestone. Well, when it rains on the forest, the dead leaves and stuff laying there are going to decay and produce uh, carbonic acid. This soaks into the ground, and so the water soaking through the ground is slightly acidic, which dissolves limestone. And that's what makes caves down in the ground, like Carlsbad Caverns and uh, the major cave systems all over the world. Missouri alone, just that one state, has over 5,000 known caves. Plus, who knows how many, of course, that aren't known. But the caves are many parts of the world contain caves. And Missouri, Arkansas has lots of them because there's just lots of limestone. So this acid dissolves the limestone. When it starts to drip, this water dripping containing the dissolved minerals, the air blows past, dissolves, evaporates the water, and leaves the minerals behind. And it starts to leave a formation. In a cave, if it's hanging from the ceiling, it's called a stalactite, sticking tight to the ceiling. If it's sticking on the ground, it's called a stalagmite. If they join together, it's called a column. And if it just drips out of a long crack across the ceiling, it makes what's called a ribbon. 
as there's a long ribbon shape, like a piece of something. And they have all kinds of fancy names for them when you go into the cave. They say, oh, this is the bacon formation because it looked like a piece of bacon or something. Of course, they're trying to get your tourist dollars is bottom line. But the fact is, caves are filling in with stalactites or stalagmites. Whether it's on, hanging on the ceiling or sitting on the floor or just making a big pile, it's called flow stone because it's rock that was flowed into place, for lack of a better uh, phrase. This uh, picture shows Carlsbad's cavern, Carl, Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico, and it says, this unfinished symphony was started 250 million years ago. Now, how do they know that? Well, somebody measured how fast these things grow, and then they calculated it takes a 1,000 years to grow an inch. And based on somebody's test that it takes a 1,000 years to grow an inch, they measure how big this is in, you know, Carlsbad Caverns and say, wow, this took 250 million years. Well, this is just plain not true. Those things grow very quickly. Here's a bat covered up with flowstone before he could even rot. National Geographic, 1953, uh, October issue. Now, how long would it take a bat to rot after he died? A few days, a couple of weeks maybe at the most. In a cave where it's you know dark and cool, he may last longer, maybe a month. But something else is going to eat him, right? Certainly not millions of years. We could agree with that, right? The decay rate may vary greatly depending on lots of factors, but certainly not, not millions of years. Most caves are about 55 degrees. Summer and winter, doesn't matter. It's about 55 degrees down in a cave. So... The bat's not going to be refrigerated. It's not like a refrigerator. It is chilly, but it's not, not below freezing. This bat covered up with the flow stone indicates it certainly did not take thousands of years for this to happen. In, under the Lincoln Memorial, down in the basement of the Lincoln Memorial, there are stalactites. Now, this picture was taken back in the 60s. These are 50-inch long stalactites called a soda straw stalactite. Very long, skinny stalactite. Over time, it'll get longer and fatter. It'll thicken up. Now, the Lincoln Memorial was finished in 1922. This picture was taken about 1960-something. So in 40 years, you get a 50-inch long stalactite. So tell me, uh, does, do they grow an inch every 1,000 years? No. Something is wrong with their calculations, right? This is from uh, Fort Pickens. You know, if you go down to Fort Pickens, they've got the old uh, Confederate fort made out of brick. Then they've got the, the newer fort, which is also fenced off because it was built for World War I, I believe. It's all concrete and steel, but the steel is all rusting. So they've got that part fenced off. How many of you know what I'm talking about out there? The, the new Fort Pickens that you can't even get in. If you can get a guard or guide to take you in there, unlock the gate, and go into the Fort Pickens that was built for World War Does anybody know it was World War I or World War II? The part that's fenced off. I don't remember either, but I heard it one time. World War I, coastal batteries, okay. In there, all over inside this fort, the old part of the fort, which has not been used, not even open to the public for many years because it's unsafe, you know, with everything falling apart in there, there are stalactites. One guy told me he went in there and saw off the electrical conduit boxes 16-inch stalactites. I sent a friend of mine in there some years ago, and he went down, talked to the guide, got permission to go in. He found some two-inch stalactites growing off a refrigeration shed. Now, they say it takes a 1,000 years to grow an inch. I would say this is indication they are not correct, right? This mine was closed down in Australia. 55 years later, they decided to go in and check out the old mine and see what's going on in there. And when they close down a mine, they usually seal the doors shut with concrete and everything because you don't want kids wandering around in there. What would be unsafe about an old mine? Yeah, they support. While they're digging in there, they prop everything up with wood. After they leave, what's going to happen to the wood? When what's the purpose of the wood being there? To hold the ceiling up. <laughs> now it's rotted, so what's going to happen? There's a good chance your ceiling's going to fall down. Plus, many mines, gas develops in them. The old miners used to have canaries. They would carry a canary with them. Now they have special lanterns on their hat. If they get into certain areas of certain kinds of gas, it's a beeper goes off, an alarm goes off. I toured a coal mine in uh, Birmingham. They have a, the biggest fan I've ever seen. 
I would say the fan blade probably was 20 feet across, run by a turbine engine, or no, a jet engine running, running this big thing, I believe it was. It was incredible. All it was doing, they built, they, they dig a tunnel down to get to the coal, they dig another tunnel up out of the coal, and mount a huge box over it with this big fan in it blowing out. So it's sucking air through the coal mine all the time they're down there digging, so they don't get a gas buildup. Is if you ever get a chance to see one of those, it's just incredible the, the money they have to spend just to be able to keep the gas out because mines build up gas. Anyway, they closed down this mine. They went to check it out 55 years later. This picture from Creation Magazine, 1980, uh, 1988, 1988, okay, 1998, March to May issue, shows what happened inside that coal mine in 55 years. Now, not a coal mine, inside this mine. I don't know if it was a coal mine or a lead mine or what they were mining in that one. Lead mine, okay. This is in Australia. There are two people inside that circle to give you an indication. Now, if you did not know anything about when this mine was dug and you walked in and saw these huge flowstone formations every place, to the typical evolutionist, they would assume this is millions of years old. When we know, it's not. Uh, a couple of years ago, when Eric graduated from college in Wyoming, on the way back from Bible College, where he went, we stopped in Thermopolis, Wyoming, right in the middle of the state. Thermo means heat. This is called Thermopolis because there are hot springs that bubble up out of the ground. We stopped and saw the Teepee Fountain. In 1903, a guy had a mineral spring on his property, so he stuck a pipe in it, made the water bubble out the pipe. I didn't get to see the size of the pipe, but I would guess it's probably about a four or six inch diameter pipe. The water came up at the top of the pipe and ran down the sides. As it ran down, it evaporated, some of it, leaving behind a mineral deposit. You get these under your sink. How many have seen where your sink is dripping? You get the mineral deposits built up there, okay, or the bathtub drips. Well, the guy died, and the pipe has been in his yard now for 97 years. Here's a picture of me standing next to it. After 97 years. That would take some lime away, wouldn't it? To dissolve that. Now they're going to tell you these formations take millions of years to form. And the simple fact is that's just not true. Under the right conditions, they can form very quickly. So don't let anybody tell you it takes millions of years. At the current erosion rate, the mud slides off the mountains or it washes out down into the ocean. Eventually, it ends up from the top on the bottom. We have landslides, mudslides, a ground creep. In California, when we lived out there, there are huge areas of California. They don't allow you to build a house because when the ground gets full of water, it all slides down. The whole mountainside slides down or just slowly creeps down. And you can see evidence of this all over the place. They put telephone poles in, and a couple years later, the pole is leaning, and pretty soon, you know, it's laying flat on the ground because the ground is sliding down, and it's just, it wouldn't be safe to build there. So we have landslides, mass wasting, ground creep, avalanches. Does the ground ever fall up? No, it's always down, right? So at the current rate of erosion, estimates are the continents will erode flat in 14 million years. I don't know that the number is accurate, but the concept is certainly right. The book In the Beginning by Walt Brown has uh, great information on erosion rate of the continents, if you want to get more on that. Now here they're going to tell us we've got fossils that are 600 million years old. Well, that's 300 times older. They should have washed out to sea 300 times. It's a fact the mountains are eroding flat. They're going to erode away. So the evolutionist answer to this is, yeah, but mountains are lifting up all the time. Okay. But if your mountain is lifting up, at the same time it's, the dirt's washing off, any fossils more than 14 million years old are going to be washed out to sea. So how can you have fossils more than 14 million years old? Any place in the world. They should have washed out to sea. And yet they'll say they're hundreds of times older than that. I'm just pointing out this doesn't fit with the, with the erosion rate. Okay, a couple more facts here on the age of the earth and we'll go on to a totally new subject next week. The first fully developed systems of word writing appeared only about 5,000 years ago, according to World Book Encyclopedia. Well, now that's interesting. If the oldest written language is 5,000 years old, according to them, 
And the oldest languages are sophisticated and complete and very modern, just even more vocabulary than we have today. Older languages often are richer and have more descriptive words. Like the Inuit Indians have, you know, 42 or 43 different words for snow. The Greeks have many different words for love. We only have one. I love pizza. I love my dog. I love my wife. I love my country. But those are obviously different kinds of love. They've only, we've only got one word. They have many different words. Older languages are often very complex compared to today. Well, if the oldest languages are complete and sophisticated and modern, and only 5,000 years old as far as the written part, a great question I've asked evolutionists and I've never gotten an answer for it is, can you please explain to me how languages evolve from grunts and groans like animals have to sentences that portray thought? We can, we can give somebody a concept. The sky is blue. What kind of a grunt would you have to tell an animal to do to explain to his brother or sister the sky is blue? They don't have any verbal communication like that. You know, they don't portray thoughts and concepts like we do. And they don't preserve this knowledge and write it, write it down for the next generation. The difference between the barks and grunts and groans and squeals of animals and language is a gigantic gap that cannot be bridged. Nobody has ever come up with a solution for how, our, yeah, for how languages evolved. The simplest answer is God created Adam fully formed, he could walk, talk, name the animals, and get married first day. It was a mature creation. And then the languages were confused at the Tower of Babel about 100 years or so after the flood, maybe 150 years, when everybody got confused into different languages. This was all done by the Lord. It had to just be miraculous as best I can figure out. But even still, all languages of the world have similar thought processes. They will have nouns to describe objects, and then they have adjectives. Noun to name the object, and adjective to describe it. Isn't it interesting that all languages have that, that same thinking process? You speak Russian, Ukrainian, and English. And if you think about it, you know, your thought process in each one is similar. Now, in Spanish, they put the adjective uh, after the noun. See the tree, big, green, and beautiful? You know, we would say, see the big, green, beautiful tree. They put the adjectives after the noun, but still, it's the same idea. You're describing a word with other words. And we can go on all day on languages. There's been many books written about this, how that languages simply could not have evolved. They had to be created. Chinese calendar says this is the year 4697. Now, that's interesting. If the earth is billions of years old, why doesn't some culture have an older calendar than that? Some have argued that the uh, Egyptian calendar is older than that. They will say it goes back, I think, 5,500 years or something like that. The problem with the Egyptian calendar, these guys obviously liked their Pharaoh, or they had to pretend they liked their Pharaoh or lose their head. You know, They built these massive temples to bury them in. Uh, they greatly exaggerated how long they were Pharaoh. Plus, there were instances where you have several Pharaohs at the same time like they're having a civil war and the kingdom breaks up into feuding factions. But they all are counted as Pharaoh, but yet they're all Pharaoh at the same time. But when it ended up in the history book, they put them in chronological order. Well, this stretches the calendar out farther than it actually should be. It's very close to impossible to get accurate dates in secular history beyond about 1500 B.C., it's very difficult even to uh, take to look at the Exodus. The Exodus was about 1400 B.C. when Moses uh, led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And people argue about the exact year, and I don't know, but we'll get into all those kind of discussions. But the fact is it's very difficult to get accurate secular histories before 1500 B.C., 3,500 years ago. So there certainly is no proof from secular history or from written language that there's anything more than 4,400 years old, except some of these exaggerated calendars like the Egyptian calendar, which stretches things out. Civilizations, the first really world empire was uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. 
That's 600 B.C. Don't you think if man had been here for three million years, somebody would have tried to set up an empire before that? Isn't that interesting that you have your first world empire in 600 B.C. with Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. The books today, I tell my folks, I'm very concerned. They're no longer really books about science. They're actually books about evolution. It seems like somebody wants to use our school system to teach their philosophy to the next generation. I think I know why. We'll get into lots more of this later. But our founding fathers in this country had a slogan. Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, what on earth is that? Define that, please. You know, really, it's tough to put a, a, a picture to that. The real original slogan was life, liberty, and property. The ownership and control of your property. That's essential to freedom. But uh, they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Rights that you can't put a lien against. For instance, do you have the right to breathe? Mm -hmm. yes. Where does this right come from? From God, right? Do you have to get a permit to do that? No. Do you have the right to get married? Who gives the authority to get married? God does. About a hundred years ago, some people got tricked into getting state permission to do something God already said they could do. And there was no such thing as a marriage license until about a hundred years ago. And most people don't realize that a marriage license is a contract between you and your husband or wife and the state. You don't have to get a marriage license. Now, if you want to get one, they'll be glad to sell it to you. But you don't have to get one. But our founding fathers had a totally different philosophy. They thought that rights came from God. And they're unalienable. You can't put a lien against them. Now, if you get a bunch of folks together who believe that, uh, they don't make good slaves. They're going to throw the tea in the harbor and rebel against King George, eventually. So, suppose you and a few hundred of your super rich gazillionaires decided you're going to have meetings a couple times a year and discuss how can we control the entire world. We would like to have us, the smart guys, be the rulers of the world and everybody else be our rice farmers, our slaves. Now, in Egypt, when Joseph became the ruler of Egypt, what percentage of the profits did he take away from the people? Anybody remember? What was their tax in Egypt? One-fifth. That's 20%. You know how much of your income goes to taxes in America today? 45 to 50%. The slaves in Egypt were off better off than we are, weren't they? They only took a fifth. Throughout the scriptures, you see that where 10% belongs to God and 10% or 20% max would go to the government. You've got to have taxes for certain things. I understand all that, and I pay lots of taxes, okay? But we have gone crazy in this country because a super, a, a super rich uh, club of real smart guys have been meeting for years trying to develop a system of controlling the world's finances. And one of the key ingredients in getting a one-world government, which the Bible prophesies will come, one of the key ingredients is you have to get people believing there is no creator. They have to think rights come from the government. And probably most of us in this room, believe it or not, already have an awful lot of that philosophy built into us. When you go to get married, you think, oh, i got to go get a marriage license. Now, why do we think that? When a baby's born, you think, i got to get a birth certificate. Why would you think something like that? It is important to recognize that the right to uh, claim marriage on your tax form is created by the government, and so a license is necessary for that. The right to claim your kids is government for the taxes. Now, you can argue the taxes. I understand, taxes, right. But once you buy into the tax process, it's like you don't need a driver's license to drive a car. This opens up a whole can of worms of who gives authority to do what and what are you going to buy into. If you want to use the Federal Reserve System's money, I mean, if you want to use their money and use their banks, see, that's not, that's not real money. This is paper, okay? So if you decide you want to use their system, then you have to buy into lots of things. 
if you want to get uh, a loan at the bank, they may say, well, we require two years of, of tax returns. There's no law that says that. That's a bank policy. And the banks are an arm of the International Monetary Fund, and it all ties together in a very complex web uh, called The Matrix. If you saw the movie The Matrix, that's what they're talking about, this complex web. And if you want to take the blue pill, you can just wake up in bed and just, you know, go back to la-la land. But if you want to take the red pill and really understand it, we've got a video we've produced here called The Straw Man, which goes off into this topic and deals with lots of this, of how you can live just fine in this world without all their strings attached. I've been doing it for a long time. You have to watch which way you walk once in a while and be careful because they're always trying to trap you back into the system, into the matrix, but it can certainly be done. The, we don't advertise the video, but if you want to get it, it's in our... Uh, Heidi can get you one, 10 bucks for the video. And when you're done, you return it, get your money back. <clears throat> if you want to study this topic, it's a fascinating subject, field, uh, field of research. But our founding fathers would never have thought about getting a permit to build a building on their property. Their philosophy was, that's my property. I don't have to get your permission to do anything on my property. I mean, that's just the mentality of the head. The, Boston, the Revolutionary War, one of the key ingredients was the Boston Tea Party, which was over a tax on the tea, and I believe it was 1% tax. Something like that. It's nothing. And we've gone nuts. But I think at one of the major plans toward a new world order that Satan has is eliminating the belief in a creator. And evolution is the great way to do that. And so early in the 1800s, they came up with a plan of how to control the world. The Illuminati did this back in 1776, even with Adam Weishaupt, and there have been modifications to the plan for several hundred years. And the group members changed, but the group itself has kept a consistent goal of world dominance through control of the currency. Right now, none of you have any money. You have a Federal Reserve note, which is not money. That's an IOU to the government. And silver and gold is, is real money, and we don't have any or much of that for sure. Long story. But I believe education was, to, first of all, public education was called for and planned as part of this major plan toward a one world government. They said, we're going to get a public education system, then we will secularize it, eliminate God, sanitize it of any mention of God, and teach the kids a philosophy that says, your right to breathe and your right to work and your right to drive and your right to get married comes from the government. And once you get this philosophy ingrained in them that the government government gives, the government takes away, you know. Everything comes and rises and falls on government. And believe me, we've got that philosophy here, don't we? Our country is saturated with it. So is most of the other world. But uh, that is a major key ingredient in planning toward a one world government, which was Satan's plan all along. God's plan in the Bible, if you compare what God said in the Bible compared to what's happening, you see there are very many differences. They talked about every man having his own vine, his own fig tree, owning your own property. They had a system set up in Israel where if you lost your property because you were, you know, poor management or whatever reason, you got it back every 50 years. Called the year of Jubilee. Ownership of property is essential. And I think we've, we've lost some of this basic philosophy of what does the Bible say versus what's happening around us. Now, because we're already using Federal Reserve notes and we're already using a Social Security number, the next step is very simple. If you want to continue getting our benefits, you come down and get a little microchip put in your hand or in your forehead, or else you can't buy or sell. We're just a few steps away from that. The chip's available right now. I've got a couple of the chips in my office. You can get the chips right now. That's not hard. Somebody told me a few months ago that 75,000 Americans already have one of the chips. Interesting. They advertise for people to try it out. Yeah. Come get a chip. Go to the store, pick up all your groceries, and walk out. It automatically deducts it out of your account by that little chip when you go through the archway, <laughs> the sensors. It's coming, folks, okay? Our job as Christians is to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, you know, to walk carefully in this crooked and perverse uh, world that we're living in. And I just want to, I want you to see one of the reasons for this great age for the earth propaganda is to draw kids away from believing in the Bible. There's a great video called Let My Children Go that says 75% of all children raised in Christian homes who attend public schools reject the Christian faith by the end of their first year of college. 
Here are my films put it out. Why on earth would 75% of the kids reject the faith? Well, because if you just sat down and read the Bible, you would come up with the idea that the earth is about 6,000 years old. That's the obvious teaching. And yet the schools are teaching it's millions of years old and we evolved. Well, kids are going to go to church maximum three, four, five hours a week. They're going to be in school 30 hours a week. You tell me who's going to win. Plus, nearly 100% of the kids go to school and less than 100% go to church. And that's what the humanists have counted on for years. We'll get into lots more on that when we get into what's on my videotape number five about how evolution is the root philosophy for communism, socialism, Marxism, and how they've said all along, we're going to infiltrate the school system. John Dewey was one of the leaders of one of the teachers' colleges in Vermont. They turned out teachers with his philosophy of humanism. Those teachers ended up being deans and superintendents of school systems, which trained more teachers. And from 1930 until today, it's been a steady encroachment of getting humanist or communist-minded teachers into our school system. And we're saturated with them. And they're teaching this philosophy that of humanism. There is no God. Government is um, the ultimate authority. Now, I'm, I'm in favor of obeying the government. But I've got a higher authority yet. And if there's a conflict, I'm to obey God. All through the Bible, you see this principle. They got in trouble because they obeyed the higher authority. They got beaten, stoned, <laughs> killed, sawn in half. You name it, it happened to them because they had that philosophy. And the problem with Christians is we don't fit into the new world system very well because if you're a good Christian, that'll be your philosophy. I'll obey the government as long as there's no conflict between what God told me to do and what you're telling me to do. Christians make great citizens because their God tells them one of your jobs is to obey your government until there's a conflict. Then you obey me. The king says, bow down and kiss the idol. Sorry, I can't do that. Well, I'm going to throw you in the furnace. Well, okay, then throw me in the furnace. I'm just not allowed to do that. I have a higher authority. Okay, we cover lots on video number one about the age of the earth and how it affects people when they lose their faith. And we won't take time. We've got to quit in a few minutes here. But Crawford Toy, a great Southern Baptist seminary professor, almost married Lottie Moon. Anybody go to Southern Baptist Church here? You've heard of Lottie Moon? Every Christmas they have the Lottie Moon offering. Used to, okay. Uh, Crawford was engaged to Mary. I don't know if he's, I think he was engaged to Mary. She broke it off because he lived in the late 1800s, same time she did. It's good to live same time, person you're going to marry. But uh, he began to doubt the Bible over that question of how old is the earth. In the late 1800s, a lot of people were teaching the earth is millions of years old. And the Christians didn't really fight that. They accepted it. And they tried to incorporate it into the Bible with the gap theory and the day-age theory, and they just plain compromised. Well, Crawford said, the Bible intends to teach a plain six-day creation. The Bible is simply in error. And if you start thinking the earth is millions of years old, you're going to have to either justify or allegorize the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Many great preachers today will say, oh, the Bible's a wonderful book, and I believe it. Now, the first few chapters is probably an allegory, but the rest of it's great. And that's what they do. Or they try to get rid of the first 11 chapters by saying, or the, they try to include evolution by saying there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2. Or that each day is not really a day, it's millions of years for each day. We'll get into those theories coming up soon about the gap theory and the day-age theory and how they just simply are not true. But that'll all be covered on uh, probably in the second course on this, this topic. All right, uh, quiz questions. What have we got so far, Heidi, for next week? Not much, huh? Two. Two. <coughs> we need to get a few. Uh, here's another one. What percentage of kids lose their faith going through public school? 75% is the national statistics here. Um, some other things we talked about. Let's see. Does it take millions of years for flowstone to form? No. No, it happens very quickly. Let's see, we also talked about... Um, what is the percentage of salt in the ocean right now? 3.6%, right. And Niagara Falls erosion rate. There we go. Well, that'll be enough. We'll have some more bonus questions on there from things we've covered, but that'll be enough for quiz questions. Thank you so much. We'll see you in next meeting.